God has been blessing the work very much, and I'm grateful that we have the blessings in the work that we have had, and we're up to about 5 or 6% increase, and that's a good thing because the whole society is having trouble, as you, as you know, and uh, it's beginning to, the job market is picking up and other things, but some of the other religious groups are having troubles, and God has blessed us. We're not rich and increased with goods, but at least we're getting enough so we don't have to beg for money and put pressure on the brethren. Maybe some of you heard about this one guy up the road here who's telling, uh, he's kind of like the IRS. You know, they used to have the joke about the Internal Revenue Service. What is your income? Send it all in. And uh, he's told some of his people to do that. So we're not doing that and not ever going to do that. But uh, we're grateful for God has blessed us in that way. So we want to be grateful for what God is doing. Mr. Armstrong said there are two reasons, two main reasons why you and I are called now. One is to do the work of God. We've got to get out the message of the coming kingdom of God. And God tells us that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness, not to convert everybody. God's not trying to call everybody now, but as a witness. And then the end will come. That's Matthew 24, 14. And other scriptures tell us to go unto all the world and preach the gospel and Mark 16 and a number of other places. Then the second reason we're called now is to prepare to be kings. We've got to prepare in this life for kingship. And we are got the ones God is relying on in a sense. He's not indebted to us, but he's planned for us to be those kings and priests under Christ in tomorrow's world. And we're really supposed to have that as our goal. That should be one of the supreme goals in our lives. You each one need to ask yourself, am I preparing as a realistic thing to be a king and priest? They're combined, teachers and rulers, as it was under Moses, a king and priest in the coming kingdom and the coming government of God. We're to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Back in Matthew, as Christ began his ministry, Matthew 4, 23, well, you know, Jesus began to go through all the cities of Galilee, preaching the kingdom of God. That was the first thing it mentions, preaching the kingdom of God, heal the sick, and so on. And that's what he did. His message was the coming government. Kingdom means government. And so we've got to understand that government. We've got to talk about that government. We've got to make that government so real in our minds and hearts that we can taste it. And we should, brethren, to really think about that, think on the details of it, think of the things we've got to do. Are we going to be fully prepared to do everything under our own ideas when Christ comes? No. But we've got to know, and he wants us to know, he tells us to feed on Christ and to know the essence of it and to have that attitude he wants, then he can add the extra technical knowledge we'll need at that time. We'll need some technical knowledge, obviously. I mean, specific knowledge of how to make decisions. And we'll certainly need, beyond everything, the right attitude of total surrender to God that whatever he says to do, once we know it is God speaking, we'll say, yes, sir, and we'll do it. And a lot of people think they would do that, but they don't. Many people we thought were deeply converted in the work have simply fallen away. We've had a number of people I've even mentioned I should not have done, but leading men in the church in the past and worldwide. They just fell clear away. I thought they knew everything, but they just fell away. They were not totally surrendered to God. They were not willing to trust God and his leadership in his church. They were not willing to believe in church government. Kingdom means government. And so we need to understand that our part in God's government now is preparing us to have a real part, a vital part in God's government tomorrow in the kingdom of God. It's a trial run. God says, if I tell this man through my human servants, as long as they see those people are true and they're right, they're teaching the truth, to do something within God's law, not something crazy, they'll have an opportunity and a willingness to say, yes, sir, and move. So the church of God and coming kingdom of God is a team, and we can move together to do God's work and will throughout the world and perhaps later throughout the entire universe. God's wanting us to have that attitude. He's wanting to build that attitude into our hearts and minds very, very much. So we need to be sure of that and be ready that we really are preparing. As I've said so many times, again, brethren, this book is the mind of God. Some of you are new. Some of you around the world who will be hearing this later are new to the truth. 
Please prove this to yourself. The Bible is the revelation of the way God thinks. It's the revelation of the way God is. It's the revelation of the way God does and acts and the way he wants to do and act in detail when you really study it. Not just read it quickly, but study it. There's so many hundreds of things God tells us about doing, about our physical health, about our family, about our children, about our job, about every phase of our lives. Study this book. Memorize it vir virtually. The main parts of it, I don't mean the whole chapters, but the key points to where you know that you know what the Bible says and you can check up on a one and be sure that it is the will of God. So that is the key, of course, of all beyond everything else and above everything else, the word of God directly. But I'm going to give you some particular points on this this afternoon. And remember, in Genesis chapter 1, I've gone over this many, many times, but I want to, for the sake of laying the foundation, God in the very chapter, first chapter of Genesis tells about he created the heavens and the earth, which may have been hundreds of millions or billions of years ago. He didn't say 6,000 years ago. He said, in the beginning. But then in verse 26, Genesis 1, verse 26, God said, let us. And we always try to review that. It doesn't say me, let us. The God, one who is God the Father today, the one we call Jesus Christ, the Word, the Logos, the second person in the family of God, let us, plural, make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. That's the first thing he said after creating in his image, have dominion. Look it up. Dominion means rule. We were created to be rulers. We were created to be part of the kingdom or government of God to rule this earth and perhaps later, as the Bible indicates, the entire universe. Let them have dominion. And he says in verse 28, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. As it said in verse 27, he, made, he created the male and female in his image, both of us. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all these other creatures, the lions and tigers and polar bears and everything else are bigger and stronger. But we have dominion over them. God has given man understanding and creative imagination that animals don't have. We put them in cages. They don't put us in cages. We have dominion. And we're to have dominion over all the earth and learn to use that dominion the right way for all eternity when we understand it. But we're to train to have a complete right attitude and the right approach to rule, the right approach to dominion. And that is part of the mind of God. Now, brethren, turn to Luke 19 in your New Testament. Turn to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and verse 19. And I want you to remember this key thing because it's something just a very basic thing that Christ is talking about here. A lot of Sunday school teachers read right over it. They don't understand what it means because God has blinded them. But it says in Luke chapter 19 and verse 11, now as the disciples heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought, that is his disciples all around him, not just the 12, but perhaps a lot of others, maybe hundreds of others, they thought the kingdom of God was near. They thought the kingdom of God was coming right away, that Christ was going to set up a government, kick out the Roman armies, and bring peace and the government of God to the world at that time. So he gave them this parable to realize it was not going to be right away. Therefore, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive a kingdom and return, and he called ten of his servants, delivered them ten minus measures of money, and he said, do business. Use this money rightly, in other words, till I come. But his citizens hated him. That is, his Jewish people sent him away and were mean to those he sent there. And so it was that he returned, verse 15, having received the kingdom, he then commanded those servants to whom he'd given the money to be called, that he might know how much everyone had gained by trading. He's using a parable, but by using the minas, the money, the talents, the time that he gave them. How much did they use that time and that talent to serve him? Then came the first, Master, your money has earned 10 minas. I've really overcome. I've served you with my strength, my talent, my time, everything I have. I've gained 10 minas. He said, good, good servant, because you were faithful over a very little. 
And remember, brethren, whatever you and I have is very, very little compared to what we're going to have. And we really need to understand that. God knows that, of course, but it's good for us to understand it. Some of our elderly ladies or some, let's say, men or others have grown up apart from the work or the church and even apart from a good home or education. They didn't have an education. One of the most dedicated men I've ever known in the Church of God was named Bill Homburger. You've heard me tell about him. He was a, a, a farmer, had a, 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 a farm in, in Texas, and he came out to Pasadena to help Mr. Armstrong. He brought himself, his clothing, his pickup truck, his whole life, and he just gave and gave and gave. He only finished the sixth grade. Some of you say, why didn't you ordain Mr. Humberger? Because he wasn't cut out for that particular thing. He had teeth missing, he had poor grammar, and he could not preach in that way. He knew that. He wanted to serve God with all of his heart, and he did. And many of us have talked, as older ministers said, many of us will probably not have as a high position in God's kingdom as Bill Humberger did, will have. And uh, God blessed him, and God used him up until his death, and a very peaceful death. He served God with his heart with whatever he had. Some of you have a lot of talent. Serve God with all your heart with those talents you have. Some of you may even have a lot of money. We don't have really very many really wealthy men in the church, but we have some. And then we have maybe hundreds of you that have you know hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe not millions, but you can give generously. And whether it's a real need, I hope you will understand. Our life is God. Everything we have belongs to God. That doesn't mean we're all to give it into my bank account or some minister's bank account as this other guy's wanting him to do. We don't ever ask for that and never have and never will. But give of what you have. Go all out. Think, how much can I give of my time, my talents, everything I have to reach this world with God's message? This is the end time message of the true work of God. So he said, have authority over 10 cities. He didn't say go to heaven and float around on a cloud all day. He says, be a king, have authority over 10 cities. Then the one with had the five talents came and he said, likewise, you also be over five cities. Throughout the Bible, that's reward they were given, authority, rule, and a coming kingdom or government of God. And we need to really understand the reality of that. I mean, literally, some of you and many of us in this room, perhaps, may have direct authority over cities, over what used to be Los Angeles. It won't be there that way anymore. It might be a great uh, a pit where the atomic bomb handed. But out there, if there's a new built city out there, or New York, Chicago, London, Montreal, Sydney, Australia, all around the world, some of God's people later will be in charge. They will the, be the mayor or the local king who's in charge of that particular city. So we've got to prepare to do that kind of job and know that it's very, very real. That's why we're called now to prepare for that kind of job. In Luke chapter 22, turn over to Luke 22 now if you would, chapter 22. And you'll notice here uh, near the uh, end of this chapter, Luke chapter 22 and beginning in verse uh, 28, he told his disciples, Jesus said, you are those who have continued with me and my trials. They went through all the trials and tests with him. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, a government, just as my father bestowed upon me that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. You know, the, the, the kings of old used to have a great big table and they'd have all their chief ministers and warriors there. So you'll sit at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging or ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's part of the job that all of us will have along with those disciples in that general sense at least. We may not all be at one big table, but we'll have that kind of a job and some of us may become very close to Christ in the way we interact. If we are very close to Christ now and interacting with him and walking and talking with God as the very real living savior that we have. But how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? What attitude, what approach should we always have in this? Well, back in verse 24, there was a rivalry between them right there earlier in this chapter. The apostles were arguing over who's the greatest, who's the greatest? 
That's the way it is in this world. The politicians are all trying to beat each other. There was a rivalry. Who should be considered the greatest? And he said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority are called benefactors. And certainly that way. Some of you have not seen the old movies about Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin, but they were men who just crushed people under them, and everybody had salute, say, Heil Hitler, or this or that, and kind of kiss up to them, as the kids would say, virtually worship them. But they didn't appreciate it. Most of them put down anyone, and anyone who had crossed them in any way, not rebel, but just not go along 100% would be put in prison or killed. But he says, not so among you, verse 26, on the contrary, he who is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. Brethren, you are to be one who serves. I can't serve you as much as I used to in some ways because I can't get my own food and I can't help my housemates, my son Jonathan and, and uh, Jonathan Bueno and others around the house to do things like I would do or used to do. I'm not able in the same way, but I'll try to serve the best I can as long as I'm here. You know, one of the greatest American presidents, I didn't agree with some of his liberal policies, but he certainly was considered great and did a great job was as all you older people remember, I bet some of the kids don't even remember, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Near the end of his speech, right after the Japanese attack, the address to the joint session of Congress, he said, we shall gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. And he rallied this nation. He had the longest presidency of any American in history. He, had, he, was, he was president of the United States for three terms plus about three or four months of a, sec or a, thir a fourth term. So no president had as long a term as Franklin Roosevelt did. But you need to realize that even how great you are, you're not very great if you don't learn this principle of servant leadership. But Franklin Roosevelt, during his entire presidency, had to be helped in and out everywhere. They wheeled him around in a wheelchair. They had to help him stand up and sit down. They tried to help uh, disguise it as much as they could but he was almost helpless physically, but he had that mind and he had the understanding of where he wanted the country to go and overall he did a very good job in a terrible situation during the Second World War. So I will carry on and I know that if anything happens to me, Mr. Richard Ames is not near as weak as I am, he will carry on and he and Dr. Winnell and Mr. Gerald Weston and many others of our leaders, all our leaders here, frankly, have been extremely loyal, supportive. They want to carry on the same way that we were guided by Jesus Christ and to a certain extent by Mr. Armstrong and those of us who studied directly under Mr. Armstrong. We do not worship Mr. Armstrong. He made mistakes. But he always tried to serve God and do it God's way, and we have proved that. So we're going to follow that same pattern, and we're grateful to have that kind of unity. We must have that. God demands that in a sense. He doesn't want people in his kingdom, in his family, to say, well, I disagree with you. Or we're going to go over here. We've had people in the church try to just buy for power. They want to take over. They want to be a minister sometimes when they're not qualified to be a minister. I can name a bunch of them. They tried to push their way in or lie their way in or play act their way in. Then others get in the ministry, but they want some big job. They think they're supposed to have this big job, and they get upset when they're not given a big job. They're not willing to wait on Christ and to know, as it says in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1, verses 22, 23, that Christ is the head of the church. He is the head of the church. And many places say that, but that particular one makes it very, very clear. He's the living, active head of the church. He will guide and lead overall if we learn to see the big picture and put our faith and trust in him. We've got to know that his government is going to be unified. We've got to know that whoever is in his government is going to be cooperative, and if he disagrees with something, he can do it. He can do it in the right way, point out something, and we'll go look it up and explain it. If we're wrong, we'll change. Mr. Armstrong changed a number of times on makeup, on counting Pentecost, divorce and remarriage, several times. I went to him several times about little technical things in the epistles of Paul. 
because I was teaching it regularly, and he came to me two or three times. Frankly, he came to me a couple of times and just asked, he said, Rod, I know you've been studying this very much and wanted me to explain certain technical things to him in Galatians. Then he got up that very Friday night and explained that that way in a Bible study. In that way, he was like a little child. We're all to be like a little child. We'll be willing to learn, willing to grow, but submissive to God's government. And if Mr. Armstrong said, no, you're wrong, and he started to explain it a different way, well, I would certainly be required to listen and not to cause any trouble if I still disagreed, but to talk to him more, pray more, and try to be loyal to God's government, not to ever try to cause division over some technical point. Don't ever get bent out of shape by technical point. Don't get bent out of shape because Mr. Rod McNair or me or Dr. Winnell or anyone disagrees with you or you have to be corrected or we change you from one job to another. I've been changed from one job to another 10 or 12 times. I've just had to get used to it. Put your faith and trust in God. And many times I found that people were trying to hurt me one man yelled at me, one of the highest men in the whole work of God at one time. It wasn't Mr. Armstrong or Ted, it was another guy. He said, I'll, I'll smash you, I'll break you, I'll destroy you. And he meant it. He meant it. And he was trying to get me clear out of the church. I was not trying to get him out clear out of the church. I tried to just leave it to God. I never went on a campaign to get him. But what he wanted to happen to me did happen to him, exactly that. He wasn't just out of the job. He was clear out of the church. God fights our battles. Christ is alive, and you've got to learn that along the way. And in my 62 or three full years in God's ministry and in God's full-time service, I've seen that happen. Christ is alive. His government is real. If you put your faith and trust in God, it will work out. So you've got to really understand that. Well, anyway, he told the disciples, he said, you'll eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But he then warned them about being all exercised about who was going to be the greatest. He says, those in authority exercise authority, but among you it shall not be so. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves were to learn that attitude. And I've given whole sermons in the past, if you older brethren will remember, on servant leadership. Do I practice that perfectly? No, but I try to. I've been one to introduce that into this church at least and talk about it 10 or 15 times at least and written about it. Think about that, and I need to think, all of us do, I'm here to serve you. I'm an old man. I don't have the same strength I had, and I have to strain to see things better or to speak better. My, my voice gets husky more easily, but I had better try to use what strength and ability I have in all that experience to serve you the best I can while I'm here. And God will judge me if I don't do that. And you had better use all the teaching and the training, the experiences, the people you know, the influence you have, the money you can give, the zeal and enthusiasm you could give to others, the prayers you could give for others, all that you can do to serve, not to exalt yourself, but to serve. Servant leadership. You, you, you lead, but you try to serve and help and build others in the way you lead. That's the thing we've all got to learn, and if God sees that that is not just something we're putting on, but that's in our heart, he will reward us for all eternity. This will be the man I know, he says, like he finally told Abraham when Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. Now I know that you fear me, he said. You're in awe of me. You really do want to do whatever I say. He can say to you and me, I know that you really do want to do things the way I say, to follow my pattern of government, my pattern of leadership. And I give you a great big job It's not going to go to your head you're going to realize I'm a little peanut compared to the Pacific Ocean. I'm nothing, but I've got to know that God is in charge and have that attitude. So we want to all do it in that attitude, our leadership. Turn back to Exodus 18, if you would, brethren. And here's one that I've given you many times, of course, but we must include this. Exodus 18, here in your Old Testament. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 13, 
Exodus 18, 13. Here was Moses' father-in-law, who was a priest of his own religion, apparently a good religion overall. They didn't have the full thing, but he understood parts of it. Part of it must have been true, or Moses wouldn't have listened to him. But he came on the next day, and, and Moses sat to judge the people. So Moses was judging or making decisions and leading, ruling, guiding the people. And he stood before Moses. The people stood before Moses from morning till evening. They had great big long lines. They're all lined up waiting to see Moses. He couldn't get to them. And his father-in-law watched that for several hours and then said, you better be careful what you're doing. It's not good. Why do you sit alone and all the people stand from morning till evening for hours? So he said, when they have a difficulty, Moses said, they come to me and I judge between one another and I make them known the statutes of God. God's statutes are the way of life in a physical sense. They were the physical law of Israel. They spelled out in a letter of the law way the Ten Commandments as to how people ought to live in a carnal society. It certainly gives us a great understanding of the way God thinks on particular details. So they come to know me. And Moses' father-in-law said, the thing you do is not good. And he said, you're going to wear yourself out and wear these people out. He says, the thing to do, you counsel the people and teach them God's ways. You shall teach them the statutes and laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, notice verse 21, you shall select, select, not vote, not politic, not try to position yourself to get ahead to flatter men. But you, Moses, the leader, shall select or appoint able men capable people, able men such as fear God that have the awe of God, which is the main first thing he always mentions, men of truth, not playing around to get what they want, but men of truth, hating covetousness, not people who are giving themselves great big salaries or great big huge mansions or uh, things that are not right, taking advantage of others. And appoint these capable men rule over rulers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. You find later King David did do that. I don't have time to, you know, read all these scriptures, but look it up and let them judge the people. And then it shall be that every great matter, the hard cases bring to, to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge, so it will be easier for you and they shall bear the burden with you. And so Moses did that. He chose able men, verse 25, and made them heads over the people. They were the local mayors, governors, whatever title you want to say, the lesser kings, the lesser rulers, he made them heads, rulers over thousands, over hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So that was the pattern at the very beginning of God's human government over the whole nation of Israel. They had that pattern which shows the mind of God. There was no politicking. It was based on able men who feared God and God guided Moses to have the perception to get the right ones in there. And that's very, very important. Then, brethren, in Deuteronomy 16, if you turn now, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 16, and I want you to read that with me here. And this is a very important scripture too. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 18, we often read that in connection with the offerings at the feast. And right after how each man shall give as he is able, in verse 17, then God said in verse 18, Deuteronomy 16, 18, you shall appoint, appoint, not, pop, not politic, but appoint. Always it was government from the top down. God was responsible. Understand this, Christ is responsible. He is alive, he's not off. I know many people, God is not real to some of you. To you, Christ is off somewhere, and we men are just doing what we think. Well, that makes the Bible a liar. God chose that Christ directly intervened and guided things. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So Christ guided these things and told us he would. He said, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates to judge the people with just judgment, just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow, notice, you shall follow what is altogether just. 
that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord God is giving you. So you're to try to do the exact right thing the very best you can. Is the government always going to be perfect? No, nothing in this human life is perfect. But overall, that is the best government if God is involved. And God is involved in the very church where God's work is being done. You better believe he's involved in that. I base my life on that. And I base my life on that for years as my older brethren and friends will remember when I was not always popular. I was not always the chief leader where several men tried to get rid of me, tried to put me down, tried to send me away. Was I teaching anything different then than I am now? No, I was not. But there was a lot of politics and backstabbing down through the decades. And you had to wait on God. In the end, God will take care of it. He is in charge. And you need to know and know that you know that. Did I make some mistakes? Oh, yes. I used to be too pushy. That's the only one big thing. I never committed adultery. I never was lying and cheating and stealing or trying to kill people. But I made the ministers get in too many visits and pushed them at times too hard, which I've later repented of many times with tears in my eyes. I didn't understand it. I gave them the same pattern that Mr. Armstrong gave me, but I was not able to realize that when I had to get in so many visits every day, when I had to fill in a report, the churches were much smaller. Later on, the churches got bigger. They had two or three churches, and they couldn't do all those things in the same way. It took me a while to wake up to that. So we've never had that in the living church of God. Right away, I appointed Mr. Carl McNair, who was very experienced and very loving and, and wise as the, as the director of the ministry in the Worldwide Church of God, in the Living Church of God, I mean. And since then, we've had Dr. Winnell and so on. We've had a very fine ministry overall, but we don't have that approach. But we all make mistakes. But no one was ever asked to do something bad. It's just that there were problems. We all had problems, but we had to wait on God, and he helped us all learn lessons through this process. So understand that. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, brethren, he says here in Deuteronomy 17, in verse uh, 8, he tells in this kingdom of God here, in the physical kingdom, if matter rises too hard for you between decrees of blood guiltiness, between one judgment or another, then you shall arise and go up to the place which the Lord your God chooses, and you shall come to the priests, the Levites, and to the judge who is there in those days and inquire of them. They shall pronounce upon them the sentence of judgment. He says, have faith in God's government. Christ was their God. He's called in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6, he was the rock of Israel. He was the one behind this government. And you shall do according to the sense which they pronounce upon you in the place where God chooses, and you shall be careful to do according to all that they order you. Then he says in verse 12, the man who acts presumptuously and will not heed the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord or judges that way, that man shall die. So if he just defies, that was in the Old Testament. Obviously, we don't do that today, but it was very serious to God. Very serious to God. They were to do what God said at his government. And this is in God's word. And all the people shall hear and fear and no longer act presumptuously. And I better be careful not to name names, but I can remember a number of ministers in the old days fighting Mr. Armstrong and saying, you're not right, we disagree with you. And where do they all end up? Often they just left the church and just disappeared. Then others of them went out and started other churches. And what happened to those other churches? They all came apart. Not one of them ever carried on doing the really big work of God that started while Mr. Armstrong was still alive and doing the work. Not one. We have had five or seven leave us. And again, I'm tempted to name names, but some of you know some that left in the last five or 10 years. And what happened to them? Not one ever carried on doing a really big work of God. Some of them cried out like they were going to, but it always came apart. And they ended up nowhere because Mr. Armstrong was God's servant. He was doing the work of God. He was teaching the truth. Was he perfect? No. He had some human mistakes, but overall he was trying to teach the truth and do the work far more 
than any other man on the earth. Far more than any other man on the earth. So it's good that we could grasp that fact and see that pattern. I remember his own son, Ted Armstrong, whom I loved, finally turned against his father. And he had the better radio voice and more personality than his dad. Lots of humor, all kinds of interesting ways of talking. But it was kind of amazing. Once he left his dad, it seemed like that special charm and that special attraction, that charisma disappeared. Some of you older brethren remember. I heard his programs 10 or 15 times after he left. It was not the same man anymore. That special anointing was taken away because he was fighting God's anointed. He was fighting God's anointed. So his, his two or three churches he tried to start, two of them kicked him out, and his work never went anywhere. And now it's virtually out. Most people don't even know there is such a work. God takes care of it. You've got to understand that. He always will, brethren. He always has. He always will. Turn, if you would, now to... Uh, Trying to read my own writing here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, brethren. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Paul tells them about being willing to serve one another in whatever way and not offend people. And he's telling the Corinthians here, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God modify yourself, not in a wrong way, but give as the best you can. Give up your own desires if you have to, the sake of the bigger good, the work of God. Give no offense either to the Jews, Greeks, or church of God. One of those 12 places were called the church of God. 12 places in the New Testament. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. We are to see the profit of others. We're to help them. We're to correct them, yes. You ought to correct your son, correct your daughter before it's too late. Not because you don't like them, but because you do like them. They need it. And God's people sometimes have to be corrected. If it's done in love and wisdom, that's what God wants. But whatever you do, do it that they may be saved. Chapter 11, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. The King James says, follow me. But the Greek is better translated as it is in the New King James here. Imitate me. Follow Paul. Imitate Paul. And all these examples, he gives you all kinds of examples about church government all the way through the New Testament. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep their traditions. God's church has some traditions based upon the principles of the Ten Commandments. They're never to be contradictory. One of the early traditions of the Church of God was extant when I even came there. That tradition was not directly in the Bible, but was based on the principles in the Bible to honor God and to glorify God in your body. And Mr. Arm told the whole church he was, got, was not kicking people out because of it, but we were not supposed to, to, to smoke because he'd already found out way back before the cigarette companies admitted it, that smoking was very dangerous and smoking would destroy the human body. And if you read articles, you know that lung cancer, due to smoking often, is one of the most slow, painful, agonizing deaths that people go through because of what? These tobacco growers, the tobacco manufacturers, the cigarette producers up here in this state and Kentucky and elsewhere, often they've been the very high deacons and elders of whole major church denominations. They were killing people, and they knew it. They weren't stupid. They finally had to admit they were producing a killing product, a product that killed and caused others to die a torturous death. The love of money is not the root as it is in the Greek. The love of money is a root. Remember 1 Timothy chapter 6. The love of money is a root of all evils. It's not the only root. It's a root of all kinds of evil. So you have to know why a lot of these people do things. Some of them know better, but they're not close to God. They don't let their mind dwell on how much damage they're doing. That tradition was good. Keep the traditions as I delivered them to you, that the head of every man is Christ. Christ is our head, and the head of the woman is the man. Now, if any of you ladies are here, I don't mean to offend you, 
but we have a whole nation here full of women libbers, and they want the women to be exactly like men. And even Mr. McNair was telling the young women here to be sure you signed up as a conscientious objector, because if they have an all-out war, they may start drafting you, or drafting your sister, or drafting your daughter right into the military, but you better understand, you better follow what God says. The head of every man is Christ, the head of a woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So you understand the leadership God has put in the family, the leadership that God has put in the church. Paul says, I do not suffer a woman to preach or be an authority over the man. And God makes that very plain. I don't want to offend anyone. I'm just saying that if you all in this church, you women as well as men, are going to really follow the God of the Bible, you're going to say, yes, sir. I used to say this as some of us grew up back in the Midwest. I'm sure other states did it. But we boys would say, we're from Missouri, where men are men and women are glad of it. <laughs> and, and they were, too. Most of our girlfriends and mothers wanted us to be real men, not wimps, not nincompoops, afraid of our shadow. We're not to be like that. And most of you women feel that way, I'm sure. But there are lots of your sisters, so to speak, other women in the world, as you know. They don't want that. They want us all to be the same. And then in chapter 6, Go back to 1 Corinthians 6, if you would. And here's another direct instruction I've given you many times about government. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and beginning in verse 1, Paul tells the Corinthians in God's inspiration, dare any of you having a matter to go against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. How dare you go down the street and try to get some worldly judge who may not even believe in God to make decisions where our whole church ought to be learning. And again, this is not real. You say, well, I don't want Mr. McNair making decisions about my life. I don't want, you know, whoever it be, Mr. Ames or me or Dr. Vanale or Mr. Uh, Saselka or Mr. Wakefield or anyone else around. Are they perfect? No, they're not perfect. No, I'm not perfect either. I'm the old guy. I may be old, but I'm sure not perfect, as I'm sure you all know. But will you trust us? Is God real enough to you that you trust us to counsel you if you have a real problem in your family or a problem with a brother or whatever, as to go, rather than going down the world to some worldly court? You say, well, the, I know your faults. Well, you don't know his faults. This guy down the road, he may be an atheist, an agnostic, he may be an adulterer cheating on his wife regularly. He might be a homosexual. You don't know who he is. You're putting your life in the hands of man, and you are forsaking the government of God your whole life, brethren, really. I've mentioned these things, but I want to mention a little bit more directly and put it right in your face where you can get it. You either learn to trust God's government and his church now, or you're not going to ever follow it in God's kingdom. And if you completely mistrust it, you're not even going to be in God's kingdom. I mean that. You've got to learn to understand and believe in and practice the government of God. I know there are people in some of these other groups that just vote and politic and go their own way. They throw out government. Yet the whole message your ties are going for, the whole message your prayers ought to be preaching for, is for God to send his kingdom, his government, back to this earth based on these principles I'm living you. And so in that sense, our whole church should be based on that government. How can you go a different way? How can you say, Christ, I don't trust your leadership. I don't trust your government. And then in the very next few days or years, when Christ comes back, you're going to have to be teaching and a key figure in a different government. No, it doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. You need to learn to respect Christ's leadership and follow that government now in this life or you're not going to have a very big job in God's kingdom later. If, if any job, perhaps you'll repent. Maybe you're not converted or you'll come up in the great white throne job and then you'll have one. But you have to wait an extra thousand years to get there. So let it be real to you. The government of God is something we're preparing for and we've got to really respect that and realize how real it is. He says here, uh, coming back then to uh, losing my place here, coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world, verse 2, and if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? 
we are training to judge the whole world. We're training to help Christ rule the whole world and perhaps later the whole universe. That's our, our training. That's why we're here. That's one reason we're called now rather than later. Do you not know that we, that is we in God's church, he doesn't say just the apostles. He's writing to the whole church of God at Corinth where some of them were drinking too much on the Passover and got drunk. Some of them were speaking in tongues and showing off, hooping and hollering in a wrong way. Some of them were doing all kinds of things. Some said, I'm a Peter, I'm a Paul. They had all kinds of human problems in that church. But he says that, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And do you not know, verse 3, that we, the Corinthians, and we in God's church, shall judge angels? We were human. But with God's spirit and growing in this understanding, we will judge the angelic host. We're going to give that, be given that kind of power. How much more things pertaining to this life? We've got to trust God to guide his ministers, to guide his leaders whom he puts in, and he shows by the fruits who is preaching the truth, who is doing the work, and who is teaching and practicing the government of God. And let me say this again to any of you who are new. I say it maybe too much, but I want you to get it. If you're looking around now or any time what to do, you should please, for your good, not my good, I may not be here another year or two. Understand that. I know that. For your good, brethren, you had better prove to yourself four things. First of all, you better prove that God is real and the Bible is his word. But then you'd better prove to yourself who is preaching the Bible more correctly, more thoroughly than anyone else on earth. Is it the Catholic Church? Is it the Baptist, Methodist, the Roman Mormons? Who really understands this book? Who makes the prophecies come alive as part of our very time today? Who's explaining all the rest of it in a way you can prove right out of the Bible? It's the church of God, and you better prove that. Secondly, you'll have to understand and prove to yourself, second point, who is doing the work? Where is the work being done more thoroughly? Who is bringing in more responses than anyone else on the earth and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God? You can check up and prove that if you want to. Do it. Don't be afraid. Do it. Nobody's going to get mad at you. Find out those things. And thirdly, who is teaching and practicing the government of God more thoroughly? Not perfectly, but more thoroughly and more correctly than any other church. When you do it properly, you'll undoubtedly find out it's right here. And you say, you're human. You better believe it. We're all human. There aren't any spirit leaders directly, spirit beings in any of the churches. You've got to find out that behind one church more than any other is Christ, that Christ is using that church to preach more of his truth, to do more of his work, and to carry out his government more thoroughly. Prove it! Things are going to happen. We're going to be persecuted. Some of us are going to die. A lot of you older people here may die. Some are going to leave and get mad. They'll get their feelings hurt about something or other. Whatever it is, they'll find some excuse. You need to know the times of trial and test are coming, and you need to know where Christ is working. So I hope that you'll really prove those things to yourself very, very much, brethren. You need it. And I hope for your sake you'll do it, not my sake. In the old, no, I want to read one other scripture here. I put an extra note in here to read Titus. Turn with me back to the book of Titus, if you would. Titus. Paul's letter to the young evangelist Titus, ch chapter 1, and beginning in verse 4. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll notice, by the way, there's no mention of the Holy Spirit. Never in any of these addresses. Always leaves the Holy Spirit out because the Holy Spirit is not a person. But just notice that every time Paul writes about it. Never mentions it. So he said, for this reason, verse 5, I left you in Crete, that big island in the eastern Mediterranean. I was there back in 19, 1963, I guess, on this trip around the world, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Does that sound awful? Paul commanded them. 
they had government. He didn't say, well, you might do this. This is a nice, humble suggestion. I'm so humble, I won't tell you what to do. I'll just give you a suggestion, and you can take it or leave it. No, he didn't say that. He directly instructed them or commanded them, however you read it, to, to do these things. He was God's apostle. That's what he said. I want you to appoint, again, not have an election. That's what they did in the New Testament, too. Appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. And then he gives the description of, the, of elders who are to be uh, uh, very dedicated and not self-willed. I say, I want to do what I want to do, not self-willed, but willing to follow God's government, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, heavy drinkers, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, lovers of helping other people and entertaining them, being good to them, and, and holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word, reading this book, studying this book, constantly guarding this book, protecting it, teaching it fully the best you can as he's been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. An elder has to have a strong enough voice, a strong enough personality, a strong enough conviction and character to put the gainsayers in their place when he has to to stand up against the gainsayers, to do battle if he has to in that way. So he should be a strong individual, and God tells us that in his word. Now back in uh, my comment on the super deacons we used to have back in the early days of Worldwide, some of you older brethren, I'm sure Mrs. Murray will remember them, and Mr. and Mrs. Davis and others. We had super deacons there, and if an old lady pulled in the parking lot the wrong way, some of these super deacons say, oh, you move it, this is Mr. So-and-so's parking lot, some big shot. Super deacons are not, that's not the attitude God wants. If it's not breaking God's law or causing trouble or division, why, if someone comes and parks in my place, we just move somewhere else. And we should. We're not to be super deacons bossing people around or super local elders bossing people around in a wrong way, that attitude. We are all of us from our evangelists, pastors, elders, every one of us, to be servant leadership. We are to be leaders, but we're to do it in an attitude of how can I help you? I want to teach you. I want to help you. I want to strengthen you. I want you to have God's blessing. I want you to be in God's kingdom and really mean that and do everything we do from that point of view to be that kind of an elder, that kind of a deacon. Now we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians, brethren, if you turn there, the first epistle to the Thessalonians. And he says here, after talking about how he had been used by God to teach them the truth, he says, we might have been made demands as apostles of Christ, verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. But he didn't try to go around making demands. But, verse 7, we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her children. And I might have been too pushy and too hard in my early ministry, but it was not my fault, it was God's fault that one thing happened. Not his fault, but he guided that. Somehow, people wonder, how did we young men... How did we come to be ministers? We were so young. How did it work out? Well, I didn't come into a church of 50 or 500 people where a whole bunch of them had been elders before me or older men. When I raised up the first church of God as a result of Ambassador College, the church in San Diego, my whole church consisted of only 12 or 15 people. Then we got up to 20 or 30 fairly fast. But at the beginning, the main membership was like one of the women that I've loved more than any other person, man or woman, in all my life. My old Methodist grandmother, who taught me and helped me so much. We had Mrs. Beischlein, Mrs. Labus, uh, Mrs., uh, I'm going to forget their names now, perhaps they've never done, Mrs. Levy, and Miss Willette. I remember Big Bryce Clark was a friend of Carl McNary. He was about six, two and a half, and 220 pound bull buck, and I was training him at that time. And he was still new, and he's a, bull, a leader in a logger, logging unit. That's what that means. But anyway, he came down with me one time, and we were talking to a little Miss Ballette. I think she was about 4 foot 11 and 100 or maybe 90 pounds or something, a little old lady. 
and I was telling her how to really repent of something, and Bryce Clark thought I wasn't talking loud enough, so he said, Miss Willette, not Mr. Meredith is saying, repent! And he got in her face, she about jumped out of the chair. I thought he was going to knock her over. You don't need to talk to an old lady that way. But anyway, he, he was just brand new. He didn't mean evil by it. But they were all like my grandmother. And they would come up afterward and say, well, Mr. Meredith, we really appreciate your sermon so much and you're so nice. And they'd hold my hand. Old ladies will tend to hold your hand. And so I let them hold my hand. I used to think, you know, don't let some other man or some younger woman, you know, might mean something. But they were all grandmothers, a whole bunch of them. And so I treated them with love like grandmothers. And that helped me to get started on the right foot, I think, because that was about two-thirds of my early church. We had one lady that was just middle-aged named Etta Holman, and her daughter there came in. And I don't know if some of you might know, she may still be around somewhere. One man was named Harry Fram, the only normal, regular type man, and he was a, had been in the Navy, but he was a bachelor or something, and he was gentle too. But we loved each other. We're a little tiny group trying to hold things together, and I didn't have to correct them or bawl them out. I was treating them like Paul says here, and I'm all glad, always glad that it got worked out that way where I could have this attitude uh, toward them. So anyway, back here in... in uh, First Thessalonians, he said, but we were gentle as a nursing mother, gently, lovingly helping these people. So affectionately longing for you, we were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. And they were dear to me, these sweet old ladies who encouraged me. They would tell me how good my sermon was. I wasn't totally stupid. I knew they were grandmothers trying to encourage this young man. <laughs> My sermons weren't that good, and I could figure that out. I was still learning, but they were so kind and so encouraging. So affectionately longing for you, we were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves, because you've become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day. And Paul did that and did that and did that. And I've never done that for a long period of time as much as he did, undoubtedly. But I do remember we did a lot of that on the old baptizing tours because we knew it was the only chance we might ever get to see these people. So we lost sleep, we lost food, we lost all kinds of things on those tours to somehow get to those people. And I always look back on that, not as bad. I don't look back and say, wow, I could have been dating girls all that summer. I could have been going to movies. I could have been going to Redding's Mill, this great big swimming pool we had in Joplin, or gone to the beach. I have never, ever thought about that. I thought, well, that's bad. I missed all that. No, I didn't miss anything. I had a precious opportunity to serve hundreds of people across the United States on three or four major baptizing tours and talk to these people and love them and help them, even if I lost food or lost sleep. So what? I was young and strong. It didn't hurt me at all. It did me a lot of good, in fact. But all of us can have that attitude all the time, not just some of the time. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, laboring day and, and night, not to be a burden to any of you, we preach you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted, yes, exhort means you ought to do it. You ought to go. Yes, that's not wrong. They weren't yelling at them, but saying, you know, Mrs. Jones or Mr. Smith, we've got to obey God to get in God's kingdom. We exhorted you and taught you in every way that you would have a walk worthy of God who calls us into his kingdom and glory. We're going to be called in the very government of God and the glory of God when Christ returns, that you would have a walk worthy of God who calls you into, not just up unto, but into his kingdom and glory. We're not just called up to see his glory. We will be in his glory. We will share that magnificent glory. For this reason, we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators. Is that word again? Imitators of the churches of God not the Catholic or Protestant church, but the churches of God in Judea, in Christ Jesus. Who were those churches of God in Judea? 
All church history shows they're the ones who kept the Sabbath. They're the ones who kept the annual holy days. Later, false leaders got in and got them into keeping the day of the sun, keeping Christmas and Easter and all the pagan days. But they were taught by the churches of God in Judea to keep what God had said. So brethren, we need to have that understanding of how God works and the whole principle of church government and following where God leads. And practice servant leadership continually. Don't just try to get close to it. Give yourself to this. Learn it. Think about it. I am a servant leader. I am an ambassador for Jesus Christ to give, to help, to serve, and prepare to be a literal king and priest in God's coming government to help people. People need help, and we can give them that help. We are taught this truth now, and we who have God's spirit. In Jeremiah chapter 31, Turn to Jeremiah 31, brethren, and you'll find back here, and I'd like to read a lot more of it, but we'll have to hurry here. This is describing clearly, if you read the verses around at the time when Israel, that is some of our relatives and friends who are not converted, if they live through the great tribulation, they're going to come back to Palestine, back to Israel, weeping and repenting. And so he says in chapter 31, verse 7 of Jeremiah, for thus says the Eternal, sing with gladness for Jacob, shout among the chief of the nations. That's modern Britain and America and the English descended peoples. Give praise and say, O Eternal, save your people, the remnant of Israel. And then he says, verse 8, behold, I will bring them from the north country. I will gather them from the ends of the earth when they're brought back from the concentration camps of the great tribulation. And so they'll come with weeping and with supplications, verse 9, I will lead them, I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water, and they'll not stumble, for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. He says in verse 12, Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat and wine and oil, for the young of the flock and the herd, their souls shall be like a well-watered garden, and they shall sorrow no more at all. Wow! They're going to sorrow no more at all because the right form of government will be taught. The right form of government will be practiced under Christ. But we need to learn how that government works to reach out to people, to help them, to build them in every way we can. So I hope we can learn to do that and have that attitude. That's the attitude we need. That's the attitude we must have. Turn back to Psalm now, one of my favorite Psalms. Psalm 72, it's a description of God's kingdom. The kingdom you and I are going to help Christ set up on this earth pretty soon, if we make it, if we could get it straight in our minds how real that is and how real God is and how real Christ's government is. Give your king the judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness. See, with righteousness, justice and righteousness, and your poor with justice. The mountains shall bring forth peace, the little hills by righteousness. He'll bring justice to the poor of the people, not just the rich politicians, but the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy. He will break in pieces the oppressor. He's not going to monkey around. He's not a little sissy Christ letting sidewise on a mule who won't do anything. He will do something, and we will help him do it with the power of God. He says a little later here, he shall have dominion, verse 8, from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. He's going to rule all over the earth. Verse 11, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him, for he will deliver the needy when he cries. People are going to come back starving, hurting, in sickness, broken bodies, broken spirit, but he'll help them. He'll reach out to them. He will deliver the needy when he cries, and the needy are going to cry out and be hurting, and we're going to have to help them. We're going to have to put our arms around them physically, emotionally, and say, I love you. God is here. Christ loves you. He wants to help you. We are going to help you. There's a new world, the world of the government of God, the government under Christ. So all that's going to be done, the poor also, and help him who has no helper, these people's lives will be blown apart. Many of their relatives will be dead, their friends blown to pieces in the coming wars. He has no helper. He will spare the poor and the needy and will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence and precious shall be their blood in his sight. 
God is going to have deep concern and love for them. Verse 7, in his days the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace until the moon is no more. Until the moon is no more. The great God will give a depth of peace and joy such as the world has never known. Verse 18, blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. That's our future. That's our opportunity. That's our calling to be part of that government, to help those people. But it must be built within our hearts, our minds, our characters now. So let's go all out, fulfill our calling, fulfill our destiny, and to be there with Christ and with many of our loved ones in the coming government of God, soon to be set up, a real government here on this earth.